I'm Jim Frolking. Uh, I was in the 8th Air Force as a fighter pilot in World War II in 1944 with the 479th Fighter Group, 436th Fighter Squadron, based in Wattisham Airfield in Suffolk County, England in 1944. How old were you when you joined the service? I was 18. I was a high school senior when Pearl Harbor happened in December 7, 1941, and I knew that we would all be drafted. We went to war right after that, you know, on the day after December 8th, the President Roosevelt declared war on Germany and Japan, and we knew all of us would be drafted or whatever, and uh, so as soon as I turned 18 in April of 42, uh, I enlisted in the Army Air Corps because I wanted to fly. I'd had this interest in airplanes and made model airplanes and gone out to the national air races to Cleveland Airport with my family and when I was a kid, a younger kid, and I knew I wanted to fly. So I enlisted and passed all the tests and was told to go home and wait. And, and uh, I was called to active duty on December 7th, 1942, one year to the day after Pearl Harbor and was sent to California for pre-flight and classification training in the West Coast Command of the Army Air Force. What base was that? Santa Ana, in, just south of Los Angeles. It was a classification and pre-flight school. And uh, we were there for a couple of months and went through all the testing. And, and uh, most of us wanted to be pilots. Not all of us made it, but uh, I did. And, uh, and we went to flight school. There were three flight schools, primary, basic, and advanced. And each one lasted nine weeks. And one was in Tulare, California. The, ba the primary training and then the basic training was in, that was the next level, uh, was in Bakersfield, California. And then I went to, I wanted to fly P-38 Lightnings and went to uh, Chandler, Arizona, Williams Air Force Base, which is still an active Air Force Base today outside of Phoenix, Arizona and graduated in November of 1943. What was it, what did it feel like when you flew your first airplane? Oh, your I, I had never been in an airplane before. And uh, my first experience was when I went up with my instructor in a Stearman open cockpit PT-17 primary trainer. That was my first experience off the ground and it was exciting. It was really wonderful. And I think I took to it pretty well. You know, the, Never had a problem and went through flight school very nicely. And they used to tell us, uh, don't get too familiar with the guys standing on either side of you because one of you won't be here. And that was the, the washout rate was 33%. Oh. Yeah. And, and what was it like when you first soloed? Uh, a little nervous. <laughs> you know, it was about seven or eight hours with the instructor and you don't know when it's going to happen, of course. And all of a sudden you're landing, you're practicing landings and he, you pull up to the flight line and he gets out and says, okay, take it away. And uh, I, I did and it worked, you know, and I flew around the airfield and came in for a landing and he said, you're fine. And then from that point on, we still went up with their instructor because we had learned to do different things and uh, he taught us. He was a great guy, and a nice guy. Did you have any problems flying the P-38? Because my understanding is that they were first introduced in the Pacific and they had a lot of problems with them. Well, the problems that we experienced were not in the Pacific because I was in Europe because right. it was high altitude. Um, and that's why eventually all the P-38 groups, which there were about four, I believe, in the 8th Air Force, uh, were all converted to P-51 Mustangs because we flew at high altitudes all the time. And the P-38s in the Pacific, most of the time, they did not. They were flying at 10, 12, 15,000 feet. And there, uh, the P-38 was wonderful and uh, nobody could you know, it was as good as anything. And, but uh, some of the guys had, in our group, in all the groups, had problems with the superchargers at high altitudes, because we flew at 25, 30,000 feet most of the time. 
because our primary mission was to escort the bombers on their missions, and they all they usually flew at twenty to thirty thousand feet, depending upon the weather and what this. Well, you mentioned a supercharger. What what is that? Well, each engine had a supercharger to give it more boost, and and uh, <clears throat> I'm not a airplane mechanic, so I can't explain it much more than that, but that caused some trouble at high altitudes, and it would freeze up, and it would, it would just not work as well, and so I never had a lot of problems. I might, maybe I had a better plane and a better crew chief, I don't know, but um, uh, I didn't have a lot of problems, but the plane didn't fly as well over 30,000 feet as the P-51 did, but under 25,000 feet, it was as good as anything. And I loved the P-38 because it had two engines and it would fly very well on one engine. And you could actually do a roll with one engine. And uh, yeah, it was a terrific airplane. Plus, it had tricycle landing gear and with a tail dragger, as it was called, the plane with uh, two landing gear in front and a tail wheel when the plane is sits on the ground at an angle and when you taxi you can't see in front of you you got this big engine sitting out in front of you so you have to uh, swirl back and forth as you're taxiing down the, the taxiway because that's the only way you could see with the tricycle landing gear you can look right out the front and uh, you didn't have to do that plus the guns in the p-38 were in the pilot's nacelle in the center, the 450s and the 20 millimeter cannon, and that shot straight ahead. And in the single engine airplanes, the P-51 and the P-47, the guns are in the wings, and they converged out at like three or 400 yards. And so you had to calculate that when you were shooting at an airplane in the, in the air. And the P-38 didn't have that problem. Well, you had the twin props on the P-38. Yes. And Did they, they rotate in opposite directions? Opposite directions. So what was the benefit of that? No torque. And a single engine airplane, 14 to 1500 horsepower, uh, there's a tremendous amount of torque on takeoff, which means you have to, it pulls you to the left and you have to apply right rudder. But with the P-38, with the counter rotating props, you didn't have that problem. Just always went straight. Oh. Perfect. So after your training was through, yeah, I think you said that you were sent over to England. Yes, well, right. I went to, after flight school, we had what was called operational training unit, and we did that in California. And we flew fighter planes, we flew P-39 Air Cobras, and we flew the P-38 Lightning for three or four months. And then in April of 1944, we were sent to New York and then boarded a ship and went to England and I arrived in England uh, in late April 1944 as I turned 20 years old and was assigned to the 479th Fighter Group. What rank were you? Second Lieutenant. Second Lieutenant, okay. Where was your first mission? D-Day, June 6, 1944. Uh, all of the P-38 groups were assigned to patrol the sea lanes from uh, England to Normandy and uh, the reason for that was is because the twin boom twin engine aircraft was so easily recognizable there wasn't anything else flying that was like it and uh, the weather was not very good on d-day if you recall d-day was originally scheduled for june 5 but was postponed because of weather and it went on june 6 the weather wasn't much better on june 6 but they did it and it worked, of course, and uh, so that's what we did. Uh, did you have any inclination as to when D-Day was going to be, or did they no, just wake you up and say, just, we're going? Well, we knew about it the day before, because it was supposed to be on the 5th, right. and all the airplanes were painted with the invasion stripes on the wings and on the uh, fuselage. All air, Allied aircraft had invasion stripes. Was and that just so that ground crews or whatever would never a them? question as to what was allied and what what was not, and that was those were painted, you know, like 24 hours before we actually flew. So uh, my first mission uh, was on D-Day. 
And did you see any combat on that day? None. No. No, no planes? No. Just other P-38s <laughs> right. and uh, lots of ships. Uh, that, that was the most ex wonderful sight I'd ever seen. It was the ships going from England to Normandy. It was, there were four or five lanes of ships going in both directions. And it, 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 there were just, there was like 7,000 ships used on, on D-Day to supply the troops with all of everything they needed. And it, it looked like you could just step from one ship to another all the way from England to, to Normandy, France. It was just an amazing sight. What about the days following D-Day? What kind of missions did you have? Well, we did that for, for four or five days, uh, patrolling the sea lanes until everything they were sure that everything was secure. Then we went back to our, our escorting the bombers. And, uh, and that's what I did most of the time was escort work. We did have a few um, strafing missions called Targets of Opportunity or uh, specific targets of like marshalling the railroad yards or airfields, but we didn't do a lot of that, just a few. On those types of missions, did you encounter much in the way of German resistance? Just anti-aircraft flak. Uh, strafing airfields was the most dangerous thing you could do. And we didn't do a lot of it, but we did some. And uh, why was it so dangerous? Because the uh, German airfields were highly protected by anti-aircraft, and and there was a lot of losses and, uh, as a, as a result of that. Because well, you you're flying at low altitude, and they've, they could see you coming and know where you are, and uh, yeah, and the airfields were just ringed with anti-aircraft. So were these the infamous 88s that the Germans had? Probably. Or the smaller aircraft, smaller ones that, yeah, for high altitude, the 88s, but they, but, uh, they had smaller guns for low altitude for planes. Now you said you had most of your missions were bomber escorts. Mm -hmm. Are there any particular missions in your mind that really stand out, um, ones that you've... <sighs> Two or three where we followed the bombers as they w were approaching the targets and the targets were always just heavily anti-aircraft covered by the Germans and you could see the puffs of black smoke from the German anti-aircraft, the 88s, and these bombers had to fly right through it. And uh, I've seen pieces of bombers falling off and parachutes, and it's a horrible sight. Uh, and we, of course, we would avoid that. We would just skirt around it, and, uh, but they could not do that. And uh, so I had just great respect for what those guys were. They were sitting ducks. But when you times. say skirt around it, I mean, a shell could come up and explode right in front of you at any time. Yeah, right? but it could, but we avoided that area. You could see the flak area. It was usually right before the target or right at the target. And the bombers had to fly right through it to hit their target. And of course, we didn't have to fly right through it because we weren't bombing. And so we would skirt around it. So your job was to protect the bombers from uh, German fighters. Correct. Did you end up in any dogfights? A couple, a couple. And it was scary. The first one was really scary. It was like a beehive planes flying in all directions, people chasing one another, and it didn't last very long, of course. It only lasts a few seconds, or 30 seconds, or 40 seconds, but it was it was a bit scary. It must have been very chaotic. Yeah, it was chaotic. It truly was. And uh, But we didn't have a lot of, uh, no, I didn't have a lot of contact with German fighters, just a couple. Do you think that uh, your training was, was better than the Germans? That's hard to say. Uh, maybe later in the war it was, but I think early on the, the German fighter pilots were great uh, and they, they, they did wonderfully well. And that's long before I got there. And uh, the 42 and 43, uh, when things were different. Now, there was one uh, mission that you were on, I believe, when you ended up getting shot down. Yes, my 52nd mission uh, was a long mission, the longest mission the group had ever flown. It was, it, the target was Brux, Czechoslovakia, which is south and east of Berlin. 
And uh, this was my second mission in a P-51. Uh, my first mission in a P-51 was the day before on October 6th, and I flew as a uh, wingman to the group commander, Colonel Hub Zemke, quite a renowned, famous group fighter commander. And we flew to Berlin that day, and then the next day we flew to Brux, Czechoslovakia, and it was the longest mission that the group had ever flown. And uh, it was my second mission in a P-51 Mustang. And uh, we got into a little scrap chasing some German fighters and we jettisoned our wing tanks, our external wing tanks. And... Uh, do you and, do that for more maneuverability? Yes, more speed and maneuverability without the tanks. And so you always, when you flew, on those always had wing tanks, uh, these external tanks. The minute you took off uh, and, and you were climbing, you would switch fuel tanks to the external tanks to use them up first and save your reserve fuel in your internal tanks that you had in the aircraft. And uh, so you would use up the external tanks. And so, I don't know, when we, we we're chasing these German fighters. Um, I think we probably used about half of the external tanks or two thirds. And so uh, we jettisoned those to get more speed and we chased them and they, they dove into the clouds and went away. But we, we, we got to them before the, they got to the bombers, which was good. And so coming back, uh, we were running low on fuel and so uh, the two of us, my flight leader and I, uh, we landed in Antwerp, Belgium to refuel, which had been taken over by the British just about two weeks before. Okay. And so we landed there and refueled, and it was a beautiful fall, sunny afternoon in October of 1944. And uh, so we, uh, we landed there and refueled and then headed back to England and that's where uh, on our flight back to England, heading northwest out of Antwerp towards England, at about 6,000 feet. We were flying abreast, at, you know, 100 yards apart or something like that, just relaxed and climbing attitude, and uh, plain trim to climb. And uh, I suppose we were going to go up to 10 or 12,000 feet before we headed over the North Sea. And we were over the Netherlands, and I noticed. Uh, tracers coming up off of my flight leader, Vic, Vic Wolski was his name. Uh, I noticed tracers coming up off his tail and so I radioed to him and said they're shooting at us Vic and I started doing evasive action. He kept flying straight and like nothing had happened and uh, they hit me and missed him I guess. I heard a clunk <laughs> in the tail and I had a pretty good idea what that was, and I looked at the hydraulic pressure, and the hydraulic pressure was at zero, which meant the tail wheel dropped out because it was a retractable tail wheel in the P-51. And then uh, shortly after that, my right rudder pedal dropped out from underneath my right foot, and I could see the cable limp on the floor. And the first thought that came to my mind was, uh, how am I going to land this airplane when I get back to England? And uh, I froze on the left rudder pedal. And then a few seconds after that, the stick went limp, which meant the cables were severed back there also. So the stick controlled your elevators and, and your uh, uh, ailerons in your wings and the elevators in your tail for going up and down and turning and uh, so I had to get out. I knew it was time to go so I jettisoned the canopy and, and released my seat belt, the shoulder harness and stood up and took off my helmet because the radio tube was, the radio was connected to the oxygen mask and so I had to get rid of the helmet and I just dove out of the airplane head first well, did you actually dive out? Because we, we spoke briefly last week, and you mentioned something about having to climb out on the wing. No, uh, oh. no, I just dove out. Okay, uh, yeah, I stood up and just dove out the right side, 
and uh, turned around to make sure I was clear of the aircraft and then pulled the ripcord. Parachute just opened right up. We had back type parachutes and we sat on a, a cushion and a, and a dinghy pack, a little inflatable dinghy, one man dinghy, and we had that connected to our parachute harness. And um, that's an interesting little tale also because when, when we landed in Antwerp and we were refueling and I, we got back in the airplane to take off, I happened to look down as I was buckling my seat belt and shoulder harness and I noticed that my dinghy pack was not attached to my parachute uh, harness. And I said, uh-oh, well, I don't know. I probably won't need it, but I better hook this thing up. And I did. <laughs> and so the first thing I did when I parachuted out of that plane was reach down and make sure that that dinghy pack was uh, attached to me because I was over water. And uh, I watched my plane spin down and explode in the, in the water. It was sad. Brand new aircraft. Probably didn't have 50 hours on it. And, it, and then I landed in the water and uh, was struggling, not struggling, but just getting out of my parachute harness. And I put my foot down and I touch bottom and I'm in water about chest deep. And I had landed on a sandbar. And so I inflated the dinghy, and got, climbed in, and I noticed that uh, there was a portion of the sandbar that was out of water maybe a hundred yards from where I was. So I paddled towards it and uh, climbed out of the dinghy and pulled it up on the shore. There were nine bales of hay on this sandbar. Uh, mystery, why they were there, I don't know. They, of course, they were all water soaked. But uh, so uh, the, uh, the sandbar, uh, the, the tide was coming in. It was late in the afternoon at that point and the sandbar, the tide was coming in and I didn't know where I was. I could see land at a distance and so I decided I was gonna stay there because I knew if I started paddling, it would turn dark before I reached shore. How far was the land away? Well, my guess was a couple of miles, yeah. And uh, the distance is hard to discern, you know, on, on water. And so I stayed there all night. And fortunately, uh, uh, I was a smoker back in those days. And my cigarettes were in my breast pocket and they didn't get wet. And I had a zip, good old Zippo lighter in my pocket. And uh, so I blew on that a couple of times and lighted it up. And so I had my cigarettes, no water, no food. We had an escape kit. With uh, I had benzedrine tablets, so I took those a couple times during the night to stay awake. And uh, there was a flare kit in the dinghy, and a ship came by during the night. And uh, I shot a flare. I was standing right next to the dinghy, and I had never shot a flare before, and I had no idea that there was a kick to it. And it kicked out of my hand and dropped down into the dinghy and burned a hole in the bottom of, of the dinghy, not the inflatable part of the dinghy, but in the canvas part at the bottom, about two or three inches long and about a half an inch wide. And I said, well, there goes the dinghy. And uh, so I stayed there all night and the ship never stopped. I didn't know what it was. I thought it might have been British Rare Sea Rescue, but I didn't think they would come that close to land over on the, the European side. And you probably wouldn't have to worry about it being a German ship at that point. I had no idea what it was, but I could tell it was moving and there was a light. And I shot the flare, but they didn't respond. And I don't know if that was a smart idea or not. But my flight leader, Vic, he had seen me go down and he had flown by and wagged his wings and radioed uh, the base that I had gone down. And then he headed back to England. and. He didn't make it either. Uh, he ended up with uh, power failure and had to bail out over the North Sea and, and spent the night in his dinghy and was picked up by British Air Sea Rescue the next day and he was fine. And uh, 
Yeah, he was lucky. It's, I'm, so we, I think it was probably the gasoline, the fuel that we, we got in, the, in Antwerp at the British base wasn't as high octane as what we were used to. The plane was, was adjusted for, and because uh, we used 130 octane gasoline, which is pretty high powered stuff, and and um, so I had a little trouble on takeoff at, at Antwerp. My plane sputtered, and, and but it, it resumed okay. And uh, so I, that was my assumption later on that that's what happened. Well, what happened after you spent the night on the sand? Well, the next day it was fogged in, and it was a beautiful sunny day, but it was foggy, and I knew the sun would burn off the fog in a couple hours, which it did. And about 11 o'clock, it was clear, I could see land, and so I, I said, well, I'm going to head out. And I thought about the, uh, the dinghy that I wouldn't have any use for it. But, uh, so I started to swim and with a life jacket on, and the water got colder and deeper, and all of a sudden it dawned on me that I had a little sewing kit in my escape kit. And so I went back to the sandbar and sewed up the hole in the dinghy, um, pumped it back up a little bit because it had deflated somewhat, and uh, got in the dinghy and it never leaked a drop. Uh, and I made, made, made it to shore in a couple of hours. And, and it was a typical dike uh, in Holland, you know, because most of the land is below sea level. And uh, so I parked the dinghy next to a fence and uh, climbed up onto the dike and there were two men standing there and I just walked right up to them and they knew who I was because they'd seen me go down the day before. Do you think they were waiting for you? Possibly, possibly. I really don't know because we didn't speak the same language. I had on a flight suit and a leather jacket similar to this one, a little darker color and uh, no hat, no gloves. and. Uh, so they took me to a house not too far away that was occupied by a young couple with an infant. And I went up into a loft in some part of the house and they fed me, which was nice because I hadn't had anything to eat or drink for hours or days. And, um, and but that night I had to leave because I knew I couldn't stay there. And they, they, uh, they thought, they had a map and I had a map, a canvas map or a cloth map, and uh, they said the British was on the other side of this island. I was on the island of North Beveland in the southwest portion of the, of the Netherlands where the Dutch islands are. And uh, they said the British were on the other side of the island and I didn't think that was true, uh, but I wasn't gonna argue with them. Uh, so um, they pointed, started me down a road and said, walk in that direction, and I did, and it was dark, of course, and I just walked and walked and walked. and On your own? On my own. Dogs were barking occasionally, not much, but I didn't see anybody, no vehicles, no nobody. And uh, so I walked for a few hours and then came to a, a village. Um, and we were trained never to go into a village at night, so I turned around and went out and found a farmhouse. Uh, and across the street from it was a hay wagon with a some bunch of hay underneath it. So I climbed in there and went to sleep. Do you recall the name of the village? Uh, Comperland. Comperland. Found that out later. And K a m p l e r. Yeah. Comperland, L-A-N-D. Why were you trained not to go into a village at night? Because, especially if it's occupied, uh, you, 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 just, you don't know where you're going, and there's Germans there if it's occupied, and so you just don't want to do that. In the daytime, there's people milling around, and you can mingle, but not at night, because there, there was a blackout, and uh, I'm sure or curfew at, at, at night at most of those places and uh, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be out. So I, as soon as I saw a, a, there was a blockade right by the entrance to the village and I just turned around and walked outside. And so the next morning I, I was awakened by a horse whinnying and uh, I got up and 
looked in each direction, didn't see anyone, and walked across the street uh, and around to the back of the house, knocked on the door, and a young boy came to the door. And uh, I had a language card, and I showed it to him, and he didn't understand, and he left. And then his father came to the door, and he had shaving cream on his face. And I showed him the language card, and they invited me in. And his wife showed up, and they took me upstairs to the second floor and uh, brought me food. And I washed and shaved and felt pretty good. And uh, a few hours later, another man came with a sheet of paper typewritten in English saying that I had made contact with the Dutch underground. And that later that day, or in the evening, uh, we'd be taking a bicycle ride, and I'd be given civilian clothes. I was to take no identification with me, no weapons, had no weapon, and no the only ID I had were my dog tags, because we never carried a wallet with us on missions. And so um, I wasn't going to give that up, but I changed clothes, and they took my uniform and jacket and everything but my shoes and underwear, and uh, buried them, I understood. I heard that later, and I was given civilian clothing. And this man came with two bicycles, and we rode for a couple of hours to the other end of the island and uh, drove up to, a, rode up to a, a farmhouse. And it was after dark, and uh, I waited outside. He went inside, and a few minutes later, another man came out all nicely dressed and came up to me and, and sh shook his hand and said, how do you do? He spoke nice English and he was a man named Willem DeVore and uh, he was a Dutch policeman and also a member of the Dutch underground. And I was at the home of, the, of uh, Isaac and Marie van der Maas. And the reason we were there at night is because they had a little five-year-old boy in the house and he had gone to bed. And so they invited me in and I was introduced to Isaac and Marie. And I was to stay at this house uh, indefinitely. And uh, there was a room up on the second floor that had no windows but it had skylights. And it was just perfect for for me to be up there, and that's where I stayed every day for three weeks. And I'd come down at night after the little boy went to bed. And uh, I never saw him, and I don't believe he ever saw me. And so I would come downstairs, and they'd feed me, and they'd bring food to me during the day. And uh, they provided, I had books, I read eight books. <laughs> and. Uh, that's all I did was just, I'd try to do a little exercising and uh, went to the bathroom uh, on the lower level, which was right near the entrance door. There was like a vestibule and off the vestibule was this bathroom. And so after dinner, I would go in the bathroom. And one night I was in that bathroom and we had prearranged a signal. If I was ever in that bathroom and I had to leave it quickly, they would, they, they, somebody would give me one word, and I forget what it was, something in Dutch. And um, so I was in the bathroom sitting on the toilet and a knock on the door. And uh, Willem was there and, and Isaac went to the door and it was three German officers. Um, they were not looking for me, fortunately. They were looking for a place to sleep that night. So they quickly, one of them went outside and closed the door and the other one opened the door where I was and gave me the signal. And so I pull up my pants and run up the stairs real fast. <laughs> and those three German officers slept right below me uh, that night and I could hear them talking and I just lay there and never, I don't think I slept a wink <laughs> all night long. And they left the next morning and uneventful. I was fortunate they never 
were suspicious of anything. Obviously didn't see or hear me. And uh, that was an interesting experience. Close, but <laughs> it worked out fine. A little bit nerve-wracking. Yeah, right. So, so you, were, you were in that farmhouse, you said, for three weeks. Three weeks. And, well, with the exception of a couple of days, uh, they had planned a house cleaning. And so uh, they didn't want to disrupt anything, their schedule. So I was moved into the village of Kats, K-A-T-S, which was where Isaac's father lived. And uh, I spent two days, I think, with him in his house right in the village. And I could stand by the lace, behind the lace curtain windows and watch the German troops march up and down the street. And um, the island of, of North Babeland was occupied, but I don't think it was a strategic area for the Germans. It was there, of course, because they were every place. And, but, uh, so I didn't see a lot of German troops. Um, and other than just before I left the uh, island, because the Germans, the Canadians were pushing north out of Belgium into the Netherlands, and uh, I could hear anti-aircraft guns going off, or artillery rather, artillery going off at night. And um, so eventually uh, two men came to me and said, we're leaving, and uh, I was ushered out of the house very quickly and didn't even really get a chance to say goodbye. And uh, we got in a boat and we rode to the next island uh, South Babeland and uh, went into the village uh, of Hoos, G-O-E-S, pronounced Hoos, and I waited there and I uh, stood on the side of the road and this Canadian reconnaissance group came into town and I went out and identified myself, showed my dog tags to them and the guy laughed and said, we find you fellas in the oddest places. And so uh, I stayed with them all day. And then um, the next day I was taken to Antwerp, Belgium, and, and uh, interrogated by the Canadians and the British, given a uniform, a Canadian uniform, and I had a complete physical and uh, had to sign every, uh, a, a, a statement that I would not discuss what happened to me with anybody. Uh, well, why do you think that was? To protect the, the Vandermas family. If, if, the, if, if I had flown again and was captured and was interrogated by the Germans, they were very smart. They were very good and they knew everybody because stories appear in the newspapers. When I was shot down, there was a story in the Cleveland Plain Dealer, a short little article, missing in action, you know. My, my mother received a, a uh, telegram saying I was missing in action two weeks after it happened, because they wait two weeks before they do that. And the Germans see, read all the American newspapers. They, they, they were very clever, so... Uh, Eventually, I got back to England and took the train up to my base, still in my Canadian uniform with no identification on it, of course, and uh, got back to my base, and I was classified as an evadee. I had evaded capture, and so as a result of that, and I had been helped by someone, and as a result of that, my tour of duty was over with in England. So uh, I had 208 combat hours. Uh, the tour was 300 combat hours. So I had another 20 some missions to fly. Our average mission was like four hours. So uh, I was sent home to the United States. And uh, I thought maybe I'd go to the Pacific, but I, I found out many years later uh, that there was a something on my records that said this officer is not to be shipped outside the continental United States without the express authority of the Department of War. And uh, so I never, I didn't know that for 
ten or fifteen years after the war ended. Why why was that note there? I don't know. Probably because I was an evade. They just didn't want to take a chance. And uh, but you know, so I was transferred around a number of places. There were so many pilots coming back from tours of duty they didn't know what to do with all of us. So I ended up in Abilene, Texas as a flight instructor in P-47 Thunderbolts, which I had never sat in one before, <laughs> but it was typical of the Army, I think. But I liked the airplane, and, and uh, these were, um, it was an operational training unit, so these the pilots were all, were all graduated pilots, but they were new, and, and we had a lot of South American pilots uh, in, in, in Abilene, Texas, and uh, what was the name of the base? Uh, gosh, I don't know. Uh, Abilene, that's all I can think of. I can't remember the name of the base. But I was there until the war ended in September. And uh, so in September 45, I was mustered out. I could have stayed in, but I decided I'd had enough. And I'd had a power failure on takeoff in a P-47, and it ended up getting off the end of the runway and messing up an airplane. Luckily, I walked away from it, but with that and some other things that happened to me, I figured well, I'm not going to take my chances anymore. Mm -hmm. I've had enough. Now, you are mustered out of the, uh, the Army Air Corps. Yes. And you come home and you start your life. And there's a continuation of that story, though, a little bit after, what, oh, 15, yes. 20 years? Oh, yes, in 1960. By that time, I'd gone to college, married, working, had children, and uh, working close. I lived in Shaker and was worked at Shaker Savings right nearby. And uh, my wife called me on the phone and said, uh, we have a visitor, can you come home? And I said, sure. And so I immediately drove home and it was Hyde Vondermoss, the son, the little five-year-old boy was now a 21-year-old handsome English-speaking Dutchman who was in the United States on a 4-H club program because they were farmers and he was like the fourth generation or third generation farmer on his land and uh, he was the nicest young guy and uh, we became very good friends and he was with us for three or four days and took him to school where the kids went and he spoke at a, an assembly at the school and uh, now, we started that, a relationship there, and which went on for many, many years. Well, this little boy, is this the little boy that lived in the house yes. you were in for three weeks and yes. never saw him never there? saw him. But I had gotten a photograph, and we had written back and forth with the Vandermas family after the war a few times. And uh, then when Hyde came for a visit, that's where we our relationship started. And... Uh, we saw each other numerous times in the, in the intervening years. It, sadly, he died a few years ago of cancer. But I met his children and his grandchildren, and I fill in contact with the grandchildren and uh, his children. And uh, so, yeah, both Isaac and Marie are gone, of course. And uh, that was a, yeah, just a wonderful, wonderful family. Well, they saved my life. Sure. Do you have, uh, we're, we're nearing the end of our conversation here, but do you have any thoughts, um, comments that you'd like to pass along to future generations about your experience in World War II that I know that a lot of um, younger kids, even middle-aged adults, really don't know much about World War II. But well, I, that's why I like to share this experience with others because I think people should know how horrible wars are. Uh, somebody wrote that that was the last good war, uh, but you know there were 16 million men and women in uniform in World War II out of a population of like 130 some million. And uh, you're talking just the United States. Just the United States. Oh. And today there's probably 350,000 of us left. So we're sadly leaving this earth, uh, you know, two to three hundred a day, and uh, I'm blessed. Uh, 
young people should read about World War II in uh, Korea and Vietnam, those other horrible experiences, uh, and, uh, and savor our freedoms that we have in this country and, uh, and enjoy them as, and, and help make them continue. And, well, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been an honor okay. speaking with you. And uh, anyway, I certainly wish you the best for the future. Thank you.